ambitions of a championship team. A real champion is a team that can take adversity in stride. It is a team that can capitalize on the good breaks. A team that when its back is to the wall, will make the big play. But there's more to a championship basketball team. There's an attitude, a relentless, stubborn, tenacious will to win. An instinct that says when the other team is down by five, make it 10. And when you've got him by 10, make it 15. There's something to be said for a series that brings two such teams together. Teams that met six times during regular season play and came away with an even split. Neither team being able to win on the other's ground. Teams that emerged clearly superior in their respective divisions. But now, now they'd be meeting head on in a seven game series. And one of the teams, New Orleans or Pittsburgh, would be crowned the ABA champion. Coach Vince Cazetta of the Pittsburgh Pipers had this appraisal. We feel they're very similar to us in many ways. They're about even us in height. They have the same amount of speed. They have uh, great shooting uh, and uh, great mobility. They certainly have a, a real fine ball player in Doug Moe. And uh, of course, Red Robbins is uh, certainly a fine ball player. And uh, their backcourt of Jones and Brown is, is extremely good. Uh, they're matched very well with us. You couldn't ask for a better series, having two ball clubs of the same caliber, the same type play, and the same type players. And here's what Babe McCarthy, coach of the New Orleans Buccaneers Western Division champions, had to say. They've got Hawkins, a fine, fine basketball player, but they have good balance. Charlie Williams is a great guard. They have good rebounding. Artie Heyman is one of the best one-on-one -on -one players in the league. So I think the clubs are similar, similar. And coming into a championship playoff, the two best ball clubs in the league meeting, I think it's, it's the way it should be. The Bucks would have Red Robbins at center, Doug Moe and Jack Moreland at forwards, Larry Brown and Jimmy Jones at the guards. The Pipers would start Connie Hawkins at center, Tom Washington and Art Heyman at the forwards, and Charlie Williams and Chico Vaughn at the guards. Game one, played April 18th at Pittsburgh, started as a duel between two men, 6'8 Red Robbins of the Bucks and 6'8 Connie Hawkins of the Pipers. Both men played superbly on offense, with Hawkins netting 39 points and Robbins getting 41. This is the redhead, number 21. And again, this time on the quick passing of Larry Brown and Jack Moreland. And now the Hawk. But the outstanding performance of Red Robbins was offset by the fine play of Pitt's Art Heyman, Charlie Williams, and Tom Washington. This is Heyman on a fine turnaround jumper. Charlie Williams pumping over a screen by Leroy Wright. And now the 6'7", Tom Washington. Hawkins again. With Hawkins and Washington hitting the boards and the fast break working, this one from Jarvis to Williams, the Pipers were just too tough in game one. And Heyman's final jumper made it 120 to 112. And the Pipers had the series opener. So Pittsburgh headed for game two with a full measure of confidence. Or hadn't they demonstrated their superiority over the Buccaneers? Hadn't they played the kind of basketball the fans enjoy? They had. It was the wide open run and shoot style that better than one and a quarter million fans had enjoyed during the past season. Colorful, exciting, it was the ABA, a new style of basketball. The kind of game that was reviving interest around the country. Not only in the fans, but in industry. And here in the Pittsburgh locker room was an example of such interest. Pro Keds, the official shoe of the ABA. Babe McCarthy's club came out for the second game, determined to make the Pipers play their style of ball. Larry Brown set the pace, slowing the game, working for the good shot, looking for the open man, like Doug Moe at the free throw line.
The Bucks knew, too, that against Hawkins and Washington, their own big men, Red Robbins, Doug Moe, and Jack Moreland, would have to be at their best. Here's Robbins. Doug Moe from the left side. And Moreland from the right. While the Buccaneers' deliberate style was having its effect, the Piper's great offense couldn't be completely stopped. Here's Jim Jarvis on an outside jumper. And again on a shovel pass from the Hawk. But New Orleans kept up the pressure. Here's Jimmy Jones driving around Tom Washington. By the fourth quarter, New Orleans had completely upset the Piper's rhythm. What had been a high-powered run-and-shoot offense was now, for the most part, bogged down by personal fouls and turnovers. With just minutes left, and sparked by Hawkins, Vaughn, and Williams, the Pipers began a desperate rally. This is the Hawk on a soft turnaround jumper. New Orleans was right back with Larry Brown. Here's Chico Vaughn on a beautiful outside one-hander worth three points. Williams one-on-one -on -one against Brown. But the Buccaneers' strategy and the fine play of Brown, Moe, Robbins, and Jones even the series. Final score, 109 to 100. The Buccaneers had earned a split at Pittsburgh and now headed back to New Orleans and their home court for the third and fourth games. Wednesday night, April 24th, and better than 7,000 Buccaneer fans jammed Loyola Fieldhouse. This is Coach Babe McCarthy chatting with ABA Commissioner George Mikan. Sparked by the fine play of Vaughn and Williams, the Pipers completely dominated the ball game for more than three quarters. Here's Chico on a drive up the lane. And again on a fast break. Hawkins moving out of the pivot to open up the lane. Fine pass from Heyman. And Washington gets a cripple. The Pipers were going great now. And in the third quarter, rambled out in front by as many as 18 points. But the Bucks were still hustling, still determined. Here's the redhead on a tip-in. Then in the fourth quarter, with just five minutes left and behind 97 to 87, the Bucks steady. Then came alive. Fired by Jackie Moreland, Doug Moe, and Red Robbins, they caught the Pipers with just a minute and a half left in the game. Here's Moreland. Moe. And now Robbins. Finally taking the lead, the Bucks turned it into an eight-point cushion as the Pipers' offense sputtered to a standstill. Final score... 109 to 101. The Pipers going the final five minutes with just four points and the last two and a half minutes without a score. A fine defensive job by Doug Moe, Red Robbins, and Jack Moreland held Hawkins, Washington, and Heyman to a total of 47 points, nearly 18 points under their scoring average. The fourth game again before a standing room only crowd at Loyola Fieldhouse, was a must game for the Pipers. Should they lose, it would be back to Pittsburgh down three games to one. Yet, the fourth game was important for another reason. For this was the game the Pipers appeared to have lost and then won. New Orleans began the game playing just as steadily as confidently as they had ended the previous game. 
keyed by the brilliant passing of Larry Brown and Jimmy Jones, the Bucks established an early lead and then grimly hung on. 6-7 Jesse Branson on an outside jumper. Jack Moreland wide open. Moreland quick pass to Mo. Inside, outside, the Buccaneers kept the pressure on. Branson again. Mo on his jumper. In the final period, Connie Hawkins began to turn the game around. Here's the Hawk doing what he does best. And again, with a great hook shot. The Pipers finally moved into the lead with this jumper by Charlie Williams. Pittsburgh by three, and the clock is running, but the Bucks aren't dead yet. Mo tries a three-pointer. Rebound to New Orleans. This will be it, their last chance. Note how Brown gets outside the 25-foot zone before launching his two-hand sack. time both clubs traded basket for basket until the final second and then it was one man one clutch free throw Pittsburgh's Charlie Williams was the man final Pittsburgh 106 New Orleans 105 and the Pipers tied the series to all game four was important not only for the Pipers victory but for the Pipers loss for during that overtime Connie Hawkins had torn a ligament in his right knee. How valuable was Hawkins? Here's what Pittsburgh coach Vince Cassetta had to say. Connie, I think, is the greatest basketball player in the world today. He's a complete ball player, does everything, and he's of great value to us. We've won uh, three or four ball games without him during the season. I'd hate to have to go through a season or a series without him, Harvey. Now it was back to Pittsburgh for game five. And while the Pipers would have the advantage of their home court, they would face a stubborn, determined foe without the league's most valuable player. Game five was unusual because for the first time since game number one, it appeared the Pipers' offense was really beginning to click, even without Hawkins. Able to offer only moral support to his teammates, Hawkins on the bench was a handicap the Pipers almost overcame. With Vaughn, Williams, Heyman, Washington, and Porter, the Pipers almost carried it off. Charlie Williams scoring. Here's Vaughn going all the way. New Orleans stayed close, though, matching the Pipers basket for basket. This is Heyman. Now, Robbins. It took this 35-footer by Heyman as the half ended to give the Pipers a four-point bulge at the intermission. But in the end, it was the free throw that beat them. The Buccaneers showing why they were the best free throw shooting team in the league. New Orleans netted a fantastic 41 of 51 gift shots, better than 80%. This is Larry Brown, and the little guy had a perfect night at the line, making seven of seven. But the best example of who beat the Pipers was Doug Moe. The 6'5 forward cashed 17 of 20 free throws. Behind in the closing seconds, the Pipers gambled with a full court press and gave up this easy cripple to Jack Moreland. That made it 111 to 108. 
Now it would be back to New Orleans with the Buccaneers enjoying a three to two edge in the series. Game six was a must for the Pipers. Lose this one, and there'd be no tomorrow. Would a healthy Hawkins make the difference? Could his knee take the punishment? Game six provided a positive answer on both counts. Hawkins could and would make the difference. Taped and braced, the Hawk played the full 48 minutes and ran in 41 points to lead the Pipers to a 118 to 112 win. Here he is from long range. But for nearly three quarters, the New Orleans club appeared headed for the ABA championship. A tremendous second period for the Bucks almost turned the game into a rout as they racked up 40 points. Here's Red Robbins. Doug Moe. Robbins again. Here's Jimmy Jones on a steal. driving around Washington for two. And a tip in by the redhead. At the half, it was 72 to 59. The Buccaneers sitting on a 13 point lead, but the cushion didn't last. Handicapped by fouls, Jimmy Jones and Larry Brown had to play loose against the ABA's best offensive machine. And the Pipers took full advantage of it, closing the gap and then forging ahead. This is Art Heyman on a driving layup. Charlie Williams. And Jim Jarvis. Final score in game six, 118 to 112. As the Pipers backs to the wall, and forced to play catch-up basketball did just that and scored a tremendous victory. So it came down to one last game, a final 48 minutes, a final confrontation between the best in the West and the best in the East. And this game would be played on the Pipers' home court, the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. Game number seven, the evening of May 4th, and 11,457 Pittsburgh fans were on hand to see the Pipers play the kind of basketball they play best, the run and shoot game. And next come the pro kids. The Pipers broke out on top, and after the first few minutes, it was obvious this was the pit offense that had made a shambles of the ABA, the offense that had swept through the Eastern Division playoffs, losing just one game. Here's Tom Washington breaking the ice. Doug Moe on an 18-foot jumper. Loose ball, and Heyman leading a three-on-one fast break. Williams, and he's fouled by Brown. Williams again, this time from the outside. At the 12 minute mark, it was the Pipers in front by four. New Orleans came right back in the second quarter and cut the lead to two with this basket by Jimmy Jones. The Pipers matched it by Jarvis. And then a blindingly fast steal by Heyman. Number 12 again, all alone under the New Orleans basket. Even the fine shooting of Jimmy Jones wasn't enough to head off the Pipers' running game. And by halftime, the Pipers had surged to a 67 to 55 lead. Nor did the 20 minute intermission cool off the Pittsburgh club. Vaughn started the second half with a three pointer as the Pipers continued to open up their lead and at one time in the third period had forged a 20-point cushion. Hawkins misses, but Washington was there. The Buccaneers weren't finished yet, and sparked by Jimmy Jones and Doug Moe, the Bucks began to come back. Here's Jones, wide open. 
Mo on a jumper from about 12 feet. And again, this time over Heyman. Hawkins trying to play keep away. Jones steals and Robbins cashes it. New Orleans on the attack. Larry Brown bringing it up. And Brown pumps from the top of the key. Charlie Williams matches it. And here's Brown again. But at the quarter, the Pipers still held a commanding lead, 102 to 86. The Buccaneers rallied in the final period. Robbins scoring here. But the Pittsburgh lead was too big. Though they closed the gap to five points three different times in the final period, the Bucks didn't quite have enough. This is Heyman. And the Pipers were able to spurt ahead each time. Larry Brown on a steal. This was the deciding game of the ABA championship. It was a game the Pipers couldn't lose, a game they wouldn't lose. This is Heyman on a fast break. In the end, it was the Pittsburgh speed that won it. Charlie Williams leading all scorers with 35 points. Hawkins finishing with 20. Doug Moe, while playing a great game against Hawkins, finished with 28. Final score, the seventh and deciding game of the ABA championship, Pittsburgh 122, New Orleans 113. It took the full seven games. And though the outcome had been in doubt several times, the Pipers finally proved what they had known all along, that they were indeed the best in the ABA. has been an official ABA presentation in association with Pro Keds, a division of Uniroyal, and the 3M Company. Western Ship Series was to begin, and Indianapolis was a fitting sight. In all of professional basketball, only four teams representing the four largest cities in America outdrew the Indiana Pacers. Indiana was the powerhouse of the ABA, while the Stars surprised everyone by making it to the playoffs. Both teams employed fast-breaking offenses led by small but exceptionally quick guards like Stars rookie Mac Calvin. Two classy ball handlers teamed in the Indiana back line, Bill Keller and Fred Lewis. Game one typified how the series was to go, with a three-point shot like Merv Jackson's a primary part of both offenses. Under coach Bob Leonard, the Pacers were a well-balanced team with fine shooters. Bob Nedelicki's hook shot had been hard to defense all year. One of the highlights of the Stars' offense was forward George Stone, a classic jump shooter. The Stars employed a Boston Celtic-type fast-break offense, which often began with a pass from center Craig Raymond. Under Bill Sharman, the Stars were an aggressive unit. That hustle is illustrated by 6'5 forward Bob Warren. After missing from the outside, Warren sprints inside and taps in a follow-up shot. Foul trouble kept Indiana's big man Mel Daniels on the bench much of the first half, and seven-foot Craig Raymond of the Stars took advantage. But Daniels' backup man, Art Becker, came off the bench to give Indiana inside effectiveness. And at the half, the Pacers led by five points. Third quarter, and Craig Raymond hits again. Indiana's bench strength was much in evidence. Veteran Tom Packer, number 44, made a big contribution at both ends of the floor with 13 rebounds and six assists. Off a pass from Thacker, Roger Brown of Indiana sets up 5'10 Bill Keller, 
for an inside shot on the seven foot Raymond. The Stars kept the score tight with the three point home run. Bob Warren hits it. Then Merv Jackson drills in another. Reserve strength helped maintain Indiana's narrow lead. Tom Thacker banks in a jump shot. Then John Barnhill, on a give and go with Bill Keller, hits off the run. One of the big questions for Los Angeles could the aching ankles of George Stone hold up under the stress of a championship series. Leading by two points at the end of three quarters, Indiana pulled away in the fourth. Bill Keller connected on two three point shots. And Mel Daniels came off the bench to score 16 of his 18 points in the final 12 minutes. Named the ABA's most valuable the preceding year, Daniels took command of the backboard. Clearing here to set up Keller for the second home run. Los Angeles couldn't stop Mel Daniels. And Indiana won the first game, 109 to 93. What the three-point shot means to ABA basketball is explained by Stars coach Bill Sharman. We have added the home run in basketball where now any of the players that shoot from behind 25 feet gets to the three points instead of the two. The overhead camera gives us a good illustration of the ABA's home run. Any shot like this by Merv Jackson taken outside the 25-foot perimeter counts three points. Now Indiana comes back down the floor and guard Fred Lewis sets up a three-point shot attempt with this pass. No good, but Lewis puts a shot up from just inside the perimeter off the rebound, good for two points. It gives the little man more of a chance to balance up his value in the game compared to the big man. There's no doubt about it that your big centers dominate the game with the rebounding block shots uh, starting the fast break. But if we can get more of the guards and the little men hitting this three-point basket or the home run, that certainly it's going to add an awful lot to their value. And the thing that makes it so exciting, it's a little bit of something extra any time of the ball game. It doesn't have to be the last two minutes of the game to get the fans excited. The Indiana Fairgrounds Coliseum was the site of game two. Bill Keller hit early from the outside. The Stars demonstrated the style of play that carried them from last place early in the season to the ABA title series. George Stone stays with it until the ball finally drops through. But this was a game in which Indiana's big men were to prevail. After a feed from Roger Brown, Natalicki missed the hook, but Daniels stuffed the rebound. Mel Daniels' strength off the offensive board was evident again as he follows up another missed shot for another patient field goal. And Bill Sharman's expression tells the story of what his team was up against. The Stars would not be beaten easily. Hustle and the three-point shot carried them to a halftime lead. After Bill Keller stole the ball for Indiana, Bob Warren took it back, and Merv Jackson connected for a home run. Jackson, who went on to score 28 points in this game as a shooter. When left open from the outside, Merv Jackson delivers. Charman's strategy and the Stars' consistent shooting gave them a 10-point lead early in the third quarter. Whenever they got the opportunity, the Stars would take the long shot, like this by Mac Calvin. But as game two wore on, Indiana's big men were the difference. Mel Daniels taps in two of his 31 points. Running mate Bob Nedelicki pops two more. Nedelicki finished the game as the most productive scorer with 32 points. The Los Angeles offense continued to free jump shooters like George Stone. But Mel Daniels on the inside was more than the Stars' defense could handle. When the Stars' defense dropped back to double-team Daniels, Bill Keller was left free for a long shot from the corner. Bill Sharman felt the Pacers' offensive rebounding was the difference in this game. While Indiana's strength was inside, the Stars continued to go for the outside shot. Bob Warren hits. But soon the 10-point lead had gone. 
Mel Daniels jumper tied the game midway through the fourth quarter at 96 all. Bob Nedelicki's shooting was spectacular. He hit on 10 consecutive attempts from the field. And with the game in the final seconds, Indiana led by one point. With the clock running out, the Stars had a chance to go ahead. But the shot fell short, and Bob Nedelicki rebounded and was fouled. Teammate Mel Daniels was shaken up on the play, but Nedelicki calmly walked to the other end of the floor to drop two free throws that would ultimately decide this game. When the first shot went in, I was real confident. When the second shot went in, and uh, there's just something mentally that you know you got the game won, and uh, we did it. Matt Calvin's attempt to tie the game with a three-point shot fails. Indiana wins game two, 114 to 111. Indiana's Bob Leonard is an intense coach. He first came to prominence as an All-American guard at Indiana University. With Bob Leonard leading the way in backcourt, Indiana teams won two Big Ten titles and in 1953, the national championship. One up for Artie. And then bring it across the top. Watch your pass across the top. Let's go. Let's go to the hoop. Now, we got one team foul. How many fouls do I got? Let's bring it down this side here. Ollie, 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 Ollie. Stay out. Get your hands up, Art. Now, let's move that ball and hit that open man. Now, go for Freddie. Hurry up. Following a seven-year career as an NBA player, Bob Leonard came to the Pacers and in 1969 was named ABA Coach of the Year. Got it? Now, come on, let's go. Let's keep front. Let's keep playing this thing. Don't give him those three-point shots. Let's go. Come on, now. The two teams then flew to the West Coast, with Indiana leading the best-of-seven series two games to none. The Pacers jumped off to a commanding lead in game three. The Stars didn't hit often. Meanwhile, Roger Brown's shooting and depth passing led the way for Indiana. Good go. He assisted Bill Keller from the outside and then fed Mel Daniels inside as the Pacers took command by 21 points in the first quarter. The Stars couldn't buy a basket while the Pacers made it look easy. Stars coach Bill Sharman had much to go over with his team at halftime. Sharman's halftime discourse was effective. The Stars moved the ball quickly to free their fine outside shooters, who'd shown very little in the first half. It was a totally different ball game in the second half. George Stone couldn't miss. And the Stars following sensed an upset. Indiana began forcing shots. This one by Bill Keller was good. The real story of game three was George Stone. He would bring Los Angeles to its first win in the championship series with a 31-point game, 27 coming in the second half. Los Angeles had it all going right. After a phenomenal first half, Indiana's shooting was off. And the Stars' fast break finally tied the score with Anderson on the payoff end. George Stone continued to hit from the outside. Seven-foot Craig Raymond assisted nicely, throwing inside to Tom Washington. He could hardly believe it himself. Bob Nedelicki finally hit a shot for Indiana. But a charging violation turned the ball back to Los Angeles. For Bob Leonard and the Pacers, it was turning into a long night. The Stars continued to work the ball until they hit the free man, and that was usually George Stone. Indiana needed points fast, and Fred Lewis responds here with a home run. The Stars' offense was simple. Work the ball, then get it to George Stone. He took care of the rest. Indiana made it close after a steal by Daniels when Fred Lewis hit a three-pointer. Los Angeles was not to be denied. 
And the Stars took game three, 109 to 106, and now trailed in the series two games to one. Bill Sharman was voted ABA Coach of the Year, along with Denver's Joe Belmont. I don't know why we can't get in front of the guy. Bill Sharman of the Stars had always been a winner. As a collegian, Bill Sharman right, was twice an All-American at Southern California. Change sides. The only way we're going to get it back is to play it smart. Don't try to jump over him. Mom. Get your hands on the guy. Now, let's try to get down low so they don't penetrate. That's where we get mixed up. And when Tom has to switch or somebody, that's when Daniels is on that board every time. Five times, Bill Sharman was an All-Pro with the Boston Celtics, playing on four right, NBA careful. championship teams. Remember what I told you? Now, pass off and move. Listen, we get this and we're only down seven. That's what we wanted at the quarter anyhow. Although we got two and a half minutes to go. Bill Sharman, an outstanding athlete. He might be even better as a coach. The story of game four is told in this opening sequence as Roger Brown hits the three-point play. Called by some the new Elgin Baylor, Brown is the toughest player in the ABA one-on-one. -on -one. Teammate Bob Nedelicki has exceptional moves for a big man. George Stone continued to hit for the Stars as they kept the game tight. But oh, that Roger Brown. His quick hands are equally productive in assisting teammates. Fred Lewis, home run. Bill Keller can also deliver from the outside. Despite Brown's heroics, the Stars kept it close as Anderson assists Craig Raymond. What? As it has been throughout the championship series, the three-point shot has been the big weapon for Los Angeles. Again, Mac Calvin's ball handling sets up the three-point shot as Bob Warren delivers from the outer perimeter. It's been said of Roger Brown, his moves mesmerize the opposition. Tom Thacker off the rebound. The Pacers led by just one point at the half. As the second half opened, the Stars continued their quick passing offense. Center Craig Raymond was effective inside. Roger Brown, on the way to a record 53-point production, personally dominated Indiana's offense. Left free, Roger Brown capitalized on the home run. With the Indiana defense covering George Stone closely, the Stars went to the backcourt for their points. Mac Calvin hits the three-point play. Roger Brown's defense was also very instrumental in the Pacers' fourth game victory. Mac Calvin frees himself again in the key. But late in the fourth quarter, Indiana breaks the game open. Thacker for three points. And then it's Roger Brown to the end. His phenomenal totals. 15 two-point field goals in 21 attempts. Three home runs. 14 of 16 free throws. 13 rebounds. 53 points. Somebody. Game four, Pacers 142, the Stars 120. It took Roger Brown many years to get his chance in pro basketball, but in a very short time, Brown has established himself as one of the game's truly outstanding players. Now they're back in Indianapolis from Los Angeles for game five of the championship series. The big question now is can the Pacers maintain their momentum and win it before this big home crowd and national television audience? Rookie guard Mac Calvin was the star's prime mover in game five. He started with an assist to Craig Raymond. Calvin made up for the lack of size with quickness and excellent ball handling. To Jackson, home run. Yes! To Stone, three more. No one wanted to win at Indianapolis more than Bob Leonard. George Stone, how do you stop it? The Indiana backline players combined for points. Fred Lewis to Bill Keller. 
Before the sellout crowd at the Indianapolis Coliseum, the marvelous shooting display continued. Merv Jackson to George Stone. In game five, the lead changed hands on 16 occasions, with the score tied 14 times. The Indiana players, when tied up, invariably look for Roger Brown, who seems always to be free. He scored 39 points. Mac Calvin of the Stars penetrated consistently with his quick ball handling, freeing himself for 33 points. Roger Brown plays tough. Willie Wise hits the deck as Brown moves in to score. The aggressive play of Mac Calvin, the former Southern California captain, is well illustrated here. Intercepting the ball, he flips it into Merv Jackson. It's quickly back to Calvin for a banking jump shot. Another quick guard, Fred Lewis of the Pacers, takes it all the way for a three-point shot that brings almost 11,000 Hoosiers to their feet just before the half. Bill Sharman felt the Stars' acquisition of center Craig Raymond was the turning point in the season. Go ahead. Indiana pivot man Mel Daniels comes right back to score on Raymond. As quarterback of the Stars' offense, Mac Calvin leads the way with his lightning-fast dribble. In this game, when a man wasn't open, it was Calvin who was hitting from the outside. With Roger Brown, the defensive player is in a dilemma. Play him tight and he'll drive, stay back, and he hits the three-pointer. A quick handoff from Calvin frees George Stone, and his jump shot is home again. Indiana goes in front by four when Nedelicki finds Keller free. Then the Pacers clear aside to let Nedelicki go one on one for two points. Watch this fake by Roger Brown. It leaves Willie Wise watching from the floor. The defense double teams Nedelicki. Roger Brown's left free. Home run, Indiana. Considered to be the fastest player in basketball on the dribble, Mac Calvin takes it all the way with a change of pace move. Working on the outer perimeter, Keller's pass finds Fred Lewis open. Craig Raymond counters with a perfectly executed pivot shot. Bill Keller, a rookie from Purdue, is directing the Indiana offense. This pass finds Mel Daniels free. He makes the shot, then goes down hard. With time running out, and Indiana leading 107 to 105, the Stars look for a last shot. Merv Jackson's the man, and he connects from the corner to send game five into overtime. On a playoff to tip off, Merv Jackson delivers again. Then Bob Natalicki makes a big play for the Pacers. Hitting the inside shot, he draws a foul. And seven-foot Craig Raymond is out of the game. Mac Calvin controls the ball for the Stars, scoring on a jump shot off the face. Calvin's counterpart with Indiana, Bill Keller, drives deep for a shot. He gets through. But it's blocked by Tom Washington. And the ball is back to Los Angeles, with Calvin hitting again from the corner. Soon after, Mac Calvin's foul shots ice game five for the Stars. Final score, 117-113. Indiana now leads three games to two. Among the entourage flying back to the West Coast for the sixth and what would be the deciding game were ABA Commissioner Jack Dolph on the right and League Publicity Director Bert Schultz. This was the last time the Stars would be at the sports arena. Next year in their new home, the Utah Stars expect to challenge again for the ABA title. Roger Brown hit early for a three-pointer. Before the game was over, he would connect on a record seven. The Stars continued their fast-breaking offense with George Stone taking it all the way. Roger Brown, on the way to a 45-point game, gave Indiana another field goal with a perfect display of one-on-one -on -one basketball. Impossible to stop, Brown took advantage of every shooting opportunity. Another home run. And Indiana's big men, like Bob Nedelicki, were very much in the game. 
The Stars move the ball on the outside to set up pivot man Craig Raymond for a fadeaway shot. When Roger Brown gets the ball, there's no indecision. On a switch hand dribble, he takes it to his spot. Home run, Indiana. George Stone, who scored 28 points in game six, drives on the Indiana defense. The Pacers and Stars traded scores. Fred Lewis connects for Indiana. Then George Stone comes back with the bomb. Guard Tom Thacker came off the bench to score 11 points for Indiana. And the Pacers held a seven point lead at the end of the first quarter. To get back in the game, the Stars continue to go to George Stone on the outside. Mac Calvin's quick hand saved the ball. And then, as he's done so often, Calvin gets free for the shot. Calvin's ability to move the ball inside left George Stone in position for another three-pointer. And the Stars have the lead. But another spectacular play by Roger Brown before the half sent Indiana to the locker room, leading by a point. In the third quarter, Bill Keller fakes the defense inside, then hits the home run. But Indiana's offense was almost entirely Roger Brown. One play turned the game. On this inside shot by Mel Daniels, Craig Raymond turns an ankle. And the star center is out for the last 19 minutes of game six. Shaking free of an attempted steal, Tom Thacker was in position to connect for three. With the stars now in front, Merv Jackson hits. Then Calvin and Washington set up George Stone. He does it again. The Stars led by two at the end of the third quarter. But the question was, could they hold without Craig Raymond? Double team, Bob Nedelicki set up Fred Lewis for three of his 18 points. Now the Pacers were on the move as Fred Lewis hit again. The individual matchup of Bob Nedelicki and George Stone got rough. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, Bobby, let's go. That's all right. Me, man. I didn't see it. I didn't see what happened. Jeez. Look at his head. You're saying they play With hard. Indiana up by seven, the Stars looked again to Stone's great outside shot. Unable to get free, Stone sets up Bob Warren. And the biggest crowd ever to watch the Stars in Los Angeles was hopeful. But Roger Brown and the Pacers smelled the roses. They were in command. Roger Brown, on the way to a record seven home runs, delivers again. The Stars were now forced to go after points fast. It works with Bob Warren. Indiana's lead was cut to four. After Fred Lewis missed an easy inside shot, the Stars came back to it in striking distance on a tap in by Tom Washington. Maybe they could do it. Now the score was tied 107-107. And this time, Lewis delivered to give Indiana a two-point advantage. Bob Nedelicki watches as Roger Brown sinks two free throws in the closing seconds. Indiana led 111 to 107. That's how it ends. Two straight years, the Pacers had been to the final series. Now they were American Basketball Association champions. Virginia Squire.
proudly present Squire Magic. Virginia, from its mountains to the ocean, probably offers to sports enthusiasts the widest variety of activities of any state in the nation. Whatever turns you on, whatever your game, you're sure to find it somewhere in the Old Dominion. Virginians take great pride in these natural assets and their state's history, which also is a constant reminder that this is a land of easy living. This has always been Squire country. But the squires of today are a far cry from their 18th century cousins. For the Virginia squires today are one of the fastest moving, exciting pro basketball teams in the country. Leaders in the American Basketball Association, the squires are the pride of Virginia sports fans from the Blue Ridge to the Atlantic, captivated by a brand of basketball that borders on magic. Squire magic is what it's called by sports writers and fans alike. You see it happen, but it's hard to believe your eyes. There seems to be magic in the team's shooting ability from anywhere on the court. Light of hand trick. Now you see it, and now you don't. And there are players who fly through the air defying the law of gravity. There are even players who make themselves disappear completely. It is this kind of magic that allows the Virginia team to boast the largest number of season ticket holders of any club in the league. And it's this kind of support that allows them to perform not just under one big top, but on three home courts. One in the state capitals newly completed Coliseum in Richmond. And in the 10,000 plus capacity Hampton Roads Coliseum, which serves Williamsburg, Newport News, and Hampton. And in Norfolk Scope, a $30 million cultural and convention center serving the million plus citizens of Tidewater, Virginia. But who are these court magicians? And what is the magnetism of ABA action that draws spectators by the thousands? There has got to be something magical about the shortest man on a basketball squad being picked as the team captain. Only to watch Roland Taylor at work can one explain why this six-foot backcorder is the leader of his taller teammates. Even the nickname Fatty, as he is affectionately called by his friends, doesn't fit. For the 175-pound guard is the fastest-moving man on any court. Not known for his scoring ability, it is Fatty's defensive agility that makes him the key player and playmaker for the Squires. Fatty's steals have made the difference between victory and defeat, coming in crucial moments to spark his squad and break the spirit of many an opposing team. When the phrase, the doctor is operating, is uttered at Squire Games, it evokes an outpouring of cheers from fans and throws fear into the hearts of Virginia opponents. Well, the doctor, to bad Squire followers, is Julius Irvin, the most exciting player to come to pro basketball in many years. As an unheralded rookie from the University of Massachusetts, Irving averaged 27.3 points a game and was the top rebounding forward in the ABA, pulling down 15.7 per game. In recent ABA playoffs, Dr. J averaged 37.8 points a game while hauling in an average of 19.3 rebounds. The greatest record scoring and rebounding for one player since the pro game began. Gigantic hands, 
unbelievable leaping ability and great body control as Irving's magic. Couple all that with his patented slam dunk, and you've got the most exciting shot by the most exceptional player in the business today. The Squire Center is Jim Aiken. This 6 foot 11 inch high rise, nicknamed Jumbo, is unquestionably the most tireless worker on the team. Ungainly as he appears at times, the Brigham Young graduate has averaged over 10 points a game and almost as many rebounds while playing in every game since the team moved to Virginia. Aiken has to be the most underrated center in the ABA. For despite playing in the shadows of the Gilmores, Beatties, and Daniels, Jumbo Jim always seems to get the job done by his determined effort and tenacity. A third-round draft choice out of the University of Washington in 1970, George Irvin proved to be money in the bank with the Squires. Forced into the starting lineup up front because of injuries to Neil Johnson and Doug Moe, the handsome bachelor came through at both ends of the court. To call Irvin a good shooter isn't doing him justice. A 57 percenter as a rookie, George hit almost 51 percent from the floor in his second season. After Bernie Williams signed with the Squires as a free agent, the six foot three inch guard averaged about 11 points a game. And as a starter, Bernie's pinpoint accuracy from outside netted some 22 points per contest. A teammate of Fatty Taylor's at LaSalle, Bernie's great speed and his stop on a dime jumper fits in perfectly with a squire's style of fast break play. The Squire supporting cast totals some 28 years of professional experience. Adrian Smith's 11 years with the pros has not only sharpened his long-range shooting, but has made him super savvy in the art of drawing fouls. Another 11-year veteran was Ray Scott, whose favorite turnaround jumper was always good for two. Add to that Willie Sojourner and Doug Moe, two muscle men impossible to contain under the board. And the mixture of know-how and youth has proved invaluable time after time in off-the-bench performance. The team does not lack for talent. And if there's any problem, it's how to get 10 court magicians to perform together on the same set. For there are times when nothing seems to go right. To solve these problems, owner Earl Foreman found a super magician named Al Biaki, made him coach and general manager of his ailing Washington Caps team and presto, a new club and Eastern Division title in their first year, and suddenly three new home courts as the Virginia Squires. The Squires maestro in the process also walked away with ABA Coach of the Year award. The Juan Bianchi wheels to orchestrate this band of round ball magicians is not always gentle. He treats his players as men without a lot of rules and restrictions, and in turn, he expects them to act as such both off and on the court. If not, they too can become spectators. Then too, they get yelled at a lot.
the only one. Even a cool coach has his hot moments, and Bianchi has spent more than one game in the locker room, listening to the roar of the crowd to learn how his team is doing on the court. sympathizes with officials, either the coaches, players, and especially the fans. It's a tough job and a tough game. And as one referee put it, you can't control these players or the action. You just attempt to keep on. Basketball is a hard, fast game. The pressure is always on for both coach and player. For every team in the ABA has their share of superstars, too. Like Dan Issel and Artis Gilmore. 6'9 and 7'2 Giants belonging to the Kentucky Colonel. The New York Nets brag both ability and depth in hardwood aces. Like Rick Barry. Delay Paul. Bill Malchioni and John Roach. And a new million dollar bonus rookie in Jim Schoen. Then there's eight year pro veteran Zelmo Beatty with the Utah Stars. One of the best percentage shooters in the game, and just as tough on the defensive board. And the Indiana Pacers center Mel Daniels is a perennial pick for ABA All-Star team. Not all basketball battles are fought on the hardwood court. There's a constant search on for new talent and the competitive struggle between teams and even leagues become big business. That's part of the job of Squires Vice President John G. Kerr, himself a basketball Hall of Famer and former coach in both Chicago and Phoenix. Red Kerr knows what to look for and how to get the stars of the future to keep the Squires on top in the ABA. And all of this provides constant copy for sports writers and broadcasters, which in turn focuses national attention on both the Virginia Squires and their home city. And probably more than any other business or corporation, the Virginia Squires have become an integral part of these communities. Virginians feel a kinship and pride in their team, and not just because they're winners on the court. The public is aware of the contribution this club makes to their area in charity. Basketball clinics for the young. and a considerable economic spin-off to both the civic and business communities where they play. To say nothing of the entertainment this team has provided thousands of sports lovers. But regardless of what the Squires do as a club, or how hard they perform as athletes, in the final analysis, it is the support of the fans who make a team successful. That loyalty is not unrewarded. Ask any Squire fan, young or old, and they'll testify that a Squire ticket is your guarantee of an evening of exciting sports action unequaled in the Old Dominion. In fact, that ticket comes with a guarantee that no one sits through a Squire season without becoming involved. Just watch.
35 as they put up the shot. It's no good. Rebounded by Zelmo Beatty, the Utah Stars. Just over a minute remaining in the ball game. Beatty underneath for the easy Utah basket to send them up by four, 99 to 95. Beatty foul is on the line to shoot one shot and a chance to give the Stars a five-point lead. Al Bianchi upset with his defense. Beatty hits the shot in sight, adds the free throw, and the Stars are up by five. Virginia has the ball down 195. Bernie Williams front court. Turns it back on Glenn Combs to race Scott back to Bernie at the left sideline. Moving on Combs to the baseline. Head faking, puts the shot up and in. The Squires are down three, 100 to 97. As the crowd comes to their feet, now back to the offense. It's Bernie outside the three-point arc, going for three to tie it up. The shot spreads the ball game a lot, up at 100. The Squire fans now sensing a timeout in the making comes off their feet. They want the timeout. Al Bianchi will not disappoint him as Patty dribbles around out front. Bianchi off the bench to call the Squire timeout. So with 13 seconds to go in the ball game and a lockup, Squires 100, the Utah Stars 100. The dramatics unfold now during the timeout. Bianchi at the Squire bench. Talking to his ball club, Virginia has the ball following the timeout. The game tied, Squires have the ball, Junior serving, drives the baseline. The shot fails to go, Willie Wise with the Stars rebound. He holds in the backcourt. Wrap around dribble, gets him across the midcourt line against the defensive Irving. Hammed in at the left of the key, looks outside, goes to Beatty. Wide open from 18 feet, the shot fails to go. Irving gets the Squire rebound. Six seconds remaining, five seconds to go, three to go. Irving drives the lane, lays it in. can't be wrong. That's the attendance at ABA games last year all across the country. And in the words of one sports writer, a Squire season ticket will soon be a premium in Virginia. May we suggest you order your season ticket early to guarantee you a good spot to watch Squire magic in the making. And check with your local Squire ticket office for special group rates. See you at courtside next season. So let's go back in time to January 1976, McNichols Arena in Denver, Colorado, for the eighth. Little twist to the back. One more left for Artis Gilmore. This starts in the corner down either baseline. Judges scoring from five to as high as 10 points on each dunk. with a big slam dunk. Oh! George Kirby. Oh! Oh! Larry Keenan going high. slam dunk. We have seen Artis Gilmore, George Durbin, and Larry Keenan. The two remaining, David Thompson and Dr. J. And here is the Denver Nuggets, David Thompson.
Thompson finishing it with a twist around, patented slam dunk, and now the doctor goes to work. We hope all of you basketball junkies out there enjoyed that special flashback. And we'd like to thank Jim Bucato of Transworld International for his help in locating this now rare video. Look for more special features on our upcoming Hawk telecasts. Until then, I'm Paul Gilbert in Atlanta.